Hi, good, e good evening, everyone, and welcome to the session on endometriosis and fertility. So tonight we'll be talking about, um, you know, around the topic, and we have some great uh, members of the panel today, which we'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves in a moment. Um, so I'm Anita Guru, and my name is pinned as Fertility in the Workplace, but my name is Anita Guru. Um, and I'm part of the Fertility in the Workplace team at Fertility Network. Um, and yeah, so we're really glad you can join us. And so I've been on my own journey with endometriosis and infertility. And, and we can be sharing a bit more later. Um, and, and the next two, and then two weeks I'm putting the top in. Oh, the I just ensure everyone's on mute? Thank you. Um, yeah, so just handing over to MU Carla if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Carla and I'm the founder of the Endometriosis Foundation. And I've also been on my uh, infertility journey too, which we'll be sharing a little more about later. Thanks, Carla. And, and Linda, over to you. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Linda. I'm Dr. Linda Farahani. I'm a consultant gynecologist and a specialist in reproductive medicine and IVF. Um, I work at the Lister Fertility Clinic at the Courtland, um, where I look after women and couples who are experiencing infertility. And I also work at, um, have a private gynae practice at um, Portland. Uh, and I also have had my own infertility journey as well, which um, we can discuss a little bit later as well. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, and just before we get going, just wanted to reiterate that I know for some of you, this topic might be triggering. You might be on your own journey um, and might be struggling. So if you need to step away from the session, please do do take care of yourself. That's going to be really important. Um, and as I mentioned, we got, we'll have time for questions at the end. So happy to take any questions. So, um, yeah, it'd be good to understand, I suppose, Carla and Linda, your own personal journeys um, and kind of, yeah, tell us a bit more about kind of what brings you here today and what you've experienced. So, so Carla, I'll, I'll hand over to yourself. Thank you. I'll try and keep a very, very long story short. Um, <laughs> So I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 25, but this was after a 11 year kind of battle to get diagnosed. I was actually under a gynecologist age 14 with all the common symptoms of endometriosis, but like most people, it took a really long time to be diagnosed. And unfortunately this diagnosis came too late. I also had PCOS, so I didn't ovulate um, and the endometriosis and the PCOS kind of came hand in hand. But by the time my diagnosis came around, and because it had been so long of having, you know, these problems with severe pain, passing out and throwing up on my periods. Um, I also had a lot of bowel issues because I have bowel endometriosis and bladder endometriosis. So I was really poorly for quite a long time. And because it was left so long, it just progressed and progressed. And eventually when I was 25, I was diagnosed through an emergency operation um where they found that I had stage four endometriosis and it had actually progressed to frozen pelvis so there was just so much scar tissue and endometriosis just completely suffocating my organs basically and just completely ruined it so the endometriosis um pretty much just destroyed all my reproductive organs my bladder and my bowel um and that was my first uh, surgery for endometriosis and since then I've gone on to have I think I'm a total of eight operations now, which was just to really try to fix the damage that had been done. But unfortunately, it's in, it is irre irreversible. So I'm now 32. I went into surgical menopause when I was 29, having to have a total hysterectomy. Um, I also had a stoma for a little while and bladder reconstruction surgery. Um, so I kind of got this diagnosis of endometriosis, but also infertility at the same time. Um, I, was, I had a type of endometriosis as well where um, the endometriosis grew inside my ovaries. So my ovaries were naturally failing. I had a very, very low um, ovarian reserve, but I did manage to do one round of egg freezing. So that's all my body could handle at the time um, and managed to get a very, very small amount of eggs put in the freezer. But um, 
because of how few I got, the the treatment was actually deemed unsuccessful. So although I managed to do that, it's not kind of uh, for sure that for certain that it will work for me. So yeah, that's a little bit of background on me. <laughs> Thanks, Carla. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, you, Carla. De you've definitely been through it, and it's it's amazing that you're here now and doing some really great work to to raise awareness. So thank you, Carla. Um, Linda, um, tell us tell us about your story. Um, yeah, so I um, was training in um, Obsangaini, um, sort of, we don't get really taught very well when it comes to sort of, um, sort of reproductive medicine, really, it's not, it's not taught that well, but I was actually doing a fellowship in reproductive medicine and IVF, that's what I thought I wanted to do, and it was around that time that I started trying to conceive during my training, and uh, couldn't get pregnant, didn't, never once had a positive pregnancy test I, I thought everything was fine I don't have a diagnosis of endometriosis by the way so it's not it's not that's not my story but um I had very regular cycles and finally went and got an AMH level done and it was um four or five or something and I was I think I was about 36 um and then I tried we tried for about two years and then finally had IVF um and uh, and then you know, I think they collected about seven eggs, only two were mature, and then I had twins. Um, and so it was a pretty, I had a pretty um, sort of, it was pretty devastated by my low AMH, but actually in the end I was, you know, we, we got really, really lucky to have the twins from so few eggs. Um, and what the biggest thing for me though was just realizing that even working in the field, I couldn't get in the sort of appropriate, accurate information about what was going on with me and so that's why um I'm just so passionate about this and and helping um you know women understand their bodies and um just being you know helping women be empowered with um knowledge basically thank you Linda and I think we're really fortunate that you've had well unfortunate that you've had that experience but fortunate that you're able to use that I suppose in, in when you're seeing sort of patients and, and clients and things like that so yeah no thank you for sharing um and just a bit about my story so nearly 10 years ago I was diagnosed with endometriosis and that was following a couple of years of um, investigations and a laparoscopy revealed that I had stage four endometriosis which was unexpected um so then started my journey and what I was told when I came around from the operation was you know, you've got endometriosis, which is what I was really dreading. And then I was told, oh, you're a great candidate for um, IVF. Another thing I didn't want to hear. So that for me started the journey of, um, you know, laparoscopies. And I've, to date, I've had five altogether, which was in the space of, of sort of four years. Um, and I've had to date four rounds of IVF. Um, and yeah, I think for me, the, the, the biggest challenge was the impact on my mental health. Um, so with the diagnosis came things like health anxiety around, you know, you know is it going to come back, especially where I was having repeated um, surgeries, but then also on the IVF aspect and, and being on that journey. And I think what really sort of has I've come to kind of work on and discover is I took on so, so much on that point of being told basically you know it's down to you that you haven't got pregnant and with that I think came a lot of self-blame guilt shame um and then you know learning about actually realizing women can have endometriosis and still have a baby um so that helped with my own kind of reframing and how I think about myself but yeah being on a journey with um, infertility that there are a lot of challenges and how that plays out mentally but also physically in terms of what my body had been through and it and does go through so mm. yeah it, it's, I suppose there's a lot for us to unpack today um and and, and I know that if it, there'll be people on this call who are on a journey and with um endometriosis and, and also in um, fertility or, or even starting on thinking about how this this impact um my fertility um so Linda Maybe 
I mean, it's a great question and a really important one um, to sort of understand how it can have an impact. And it's sort of needing to understand what endometriosis is and um and how it how it sort of um how it progresses and so what we understand about endo is that it is this sort of chronic progressive inflammatory sort of condition and because of that it can um change over time in terms of how it might affect someone's fertility and i would say the main ways um so one way is that it can cause scarring um, inside inside the pelvis, and that can have a number of different impacts. So one is that it could cause scarring uh, around the fallopian tube, um, which means that where, that's where the egg and the sperm would meet and the egg would become fertilized, so it might prevent the egg and the sperm from meeting. Um, so that, that's one, um, one common way. Um, another way is actually just um, not necessarily even blocking the tubes, but causing the pelvis to become, become more distorted. So usually we have everything is sort of sitting um, quite close to one another. So the ovaries and sort of, we, I like to sort of, you know, my arms are the tubes and your ovaries are my hands essentially. And they're all sort of sitting near each other. And then if you have endometriosis, what we sometimes see is the ovary might be up high and the tube might be sort of tucked behind or, you know, all sorts of things so that the egg can't actually make it to the tube and, and sort of then um, uh, and then meet, meet the sperm. So that's another way. So pelvic distortion scarring is one way that endometriosis can affect fertility. And the other um, main way that... I, I see um, quite a lot of actually probably in my uh, in the fertility clinic is um, sort of the inflammatory aspect of it, the progressive nature of it. And and sort of, Carla, you mentioned it with the um, sort of endometriotic cyst, sort of it has an impact on egg numbers and also egg and importantly egg quality. And so you find young women might have lower than expected egg numbers. And that in itself doesn't stop women from conceiving because ultimately egg numbers aren't sort of um, predictive of getting pregnant naturally because you need one egg but um if that's happening at a fast rate and then eventually women do find it difficult to conceive when they have endometriosis it, at that point egg numbers might be low and things like ivf may become more difficult as well so that's another way and um and then I think um, you've both probably experienced this is sort of actually the management of endometriosis um, is a, is a, if, if you're not looked after by someone who's considering your fertility, um, having endometriotic cysts removed, perhaps maybe when you, at the, not at the appropriate time or various different types of surgeries themselves could have um, a negative impact on fertility. But I go back to what you say, Anita, and you're right, you know, many, many women with endometriosis will have no problem with conceiving and having a baby, but it's important that you're aware of it at an early stage. Thank you, Linda. Um, and yeah, it, I think it is the, I think a lot of challenges around the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. a woman might be struggling to get pregnant, but there is, um, I suppose, challenges around diagnosis and and kind of what's kind of your experience or, or advice when it comes to things like diagnosis um yeah I mean I think you both will have amazing sort of advice to give from your own personal experiences but from my sort of professional experience it's sort of um and I think some of the work that Carla's doing which is sort of um those um symptom checklists that sort of knowing that if it's being having the knowledge and the um to be able to advocate for yourself and say, look, this is not right. You know, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling this, this pain, this um, you know, it's just not correct. And if you don't, if you don't feel that someone's listening to you, your GP, go and see someone else. Um, because at, at that point you have no idea, it might might be endometriosis, it might be something else. But I think the biggest piece of advice for me is that there are doctors out there who care and who will listen, and there are some who aren't going to be as good and that's unfortunate to say and I don't like to say it but it's it, I'm sure everyone not everyone but I'm sure many people have experienced that so if you feel you're not being listened to the biggest piece of advice I can give you is find someone who will listen. I find as well because obviously it is so difficult to get that diagnosis and I remember I mean I'm going back to 2015 even bef way before that when I used to go to my GP or my nurse and talk and kind of complain about this pain these symptoms 
they just didn't really want to know and it was kind of one of those things like you know this is a period get on with it you'll grow out of it but I think nowadays we through now setting up a charity and being involved in so many so many different people's care pathways and even assisting referrals and things we still see it day in day out and I do find that if you're refused a referral or if you're refused investigation we tend to encourage people to say okay but can you make a note of that can you make a note that you've you've said no to this and it does seem to give them a little bit of a kick up the bum <laughs> okay, okay all right let's look into it or printing out the nice guidelines and just show just so they can sometimes prompt them so okay this person's done research you know on these guidelines it says if I have if I suffer with this this and this then I should be sent here just having these little kind of tools to, mm -hmm. and also it's so Great. important to have a good relationship with your GP you know yeah yeah that's true yeah no definitely and and you know you both said some really you know important points and Carla just coming back to you what are the nice guidelines? Because some there might be someone on the call who are not we're not quite familiar with it. Oh, Linda, you might be better going talking about the nice guidelines actually. Um, yeah, I mean the nice guidelines will have a sort of symptom checklist on there, and um, I think the the important thing is understanding what the common symptoms are with endometriosis. They so, you know obviously um, pelvic pain, um, pain that is um, cyclical perhaps, but not everyone will just have cyclical pain. Some people will have pain at various different times in their cycle or continually. Um, and um, a, a lot of sort of pelvic type symptoms, but the, the thing about endometriosis is that, and I think the problem is, is that many um, doctors will not consider either very young people to have endometriosis because we think, no, no, it needs time to sort of progress and develop into symptoms. So they might sort of think, oh, it's not, it doesn't uh, uh, impact uh, younger women or women on the other end of the spectrum who are sort of um, perimenopausal and postmenopausal and that sort of, no, you'll be fine once you hit the menopause and, it, you know, you're not going to have any symptoms. Um, so I think uh, yeah, there'll definitely be a symptom checklist um, and, you know, also so the NICE guidance or the NHS um, website. Uh, and I think that's really important to uh, know what they are. Uh, and as uh, Carla mentioned earlier, you know, your endometriosis can be on the bowel, it can be on the bladder. So you might have um, pain, pain on opening your bowel or a feeling of um, or, or really problems with uh, when you're we call, sort of um, what do we call it? Sort of endo. Um, uh, oh, Sorry. <laughs> um uh endo belly you know so when you're when you eat certain types of food you sort of get really bloated and and things like that so it's just recognizing that your symptoms are that the, your symptoms are affecting your quality of life and that mm -hmm. and that's important and then yeah taking along that nice guidance and saying mm -hmm. i've got all of these you know help me and it can act as, as like a guide for your healthcare professionals on where to send you and what steps to take towards a, a diagnosis or towards investigations. And I know at the moment to diagnose endometriosis currently, there isn't a simple diagnostic test. Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment, the only way to officially diagnose the condition is by undergoing a laparoscopic surgery, which is invasive and everybody wants to have an operation. Um, so I was recently made a patient decision aid for NICE. So I've had a say over the new guidelines, which is amazing because I can be quite bossy and they have taken on board what I say. Um, <laughs> so now it actually the new uh, guidance for the patient decision aid is that it says it kind of states that you can have this suspected diagnosis, providing obviously everything other other potential causes are ruled out which I think is really positive because actually ha not having that surgical diagnosis at the moment for some people can really cause a lot of barriers between them getting to see a pelvic floor physio or a counsellor and so having that suspected diagnosis there um, that, that that can be kind of given without having the need to have to have an invasive operation um, can be really helpful for that so I'm looking forward to that being released. That's amazing. Amazing. And I suppose as you as you were both talking, I was thinking, is when someone has a diagnosis of endometriosis, is it anything that can be done to almost preserve the um, fertility? Is it any steps that um, someone can take to kind of avoid it becoming such a barrier or such a challenge? Um, I mean, in real terms, that, I mean, there are definitely things that you know, we can 
think about or talk about in terms of um, management of symptoms, for example, um, like various different sort of diets and and um, supplements like zinc, for example, has been um, found to be helpful with, with symptom control and sort of anti-inflammatory diets, for example. But I would say, uh, and th there is some evidence that, you know, with, um, for example, some women will go on to medical management and that can perhaps in some women, it can help with um, the progression of the disease or women who have surgical management and then have a coil, like a Mirena coil fitted, for example, that can help with progression of the disease. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work for everybody. So there's sometimes it is a bit of a trial and error. And and, and unfortunately, this is part of um, the, the uh, you know, the complexity of endometriosis is that it's not a one size fits all. But there are options out there. But in terms of fertility preservation um, or, you know, uh, yeah, as you said, really the only only method we have of preserving fertility is, is egg freezing. And um, you know, and Carla, I I didn't actually know what I didn't I hadn't, hadn't realised what you said earlier about the number of eggs you collected. But you know, it's not a guarantee, uh, and so mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what we have. Yeah, yeah. and you know, Lynn, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Obviously, I didn't know I had endometriosis until I was diagnosed. I'd never heard of it. I had no idea what it was or what it meant and I froze my eggs around a year and a half after my diagnosis and I just wish I'd done it sooner I wish I'd done it when I was a lot younger I just wish I'd done that because I had so much scar tissue I had frozen pelvis and I had so much scar tissue one of my uh, one of my ovaries were actually detached and buried somewhere <laughs> among oh. so much scar tissue and so the ovary that had the most eggs in they couldn't get to so oh. it's just so frustrating yeah. to have to go that and feel because it's not a very pleasant um treatment either but no. to go that and not get a good result was yeah it's, it's hard but I think you know events like this and meeting people like Anita and, and you Linda it just helps you less feel less alone doesn't it and you know hopefully with more awareness yeah. then we'll, we'll get more support there too yeah, yeah. definitely definitely and, and it just reminds me of the, when I had my first round of IVF, um, I was on the long protocol um, and there wasn't really any, there's only one follicle that was showing during the scans. And I did challenge and say, should we be continuing with this? Mm. And what she said to me was, oh, because you've got endometriosis, that's all you're going to get. Um, well, no, that wasn't the case because I went on to have um, other rounds and I had, I did, but in the first round, there were no eggs retrieved. So it was an empty follicle. So I went through the whole process of you know, wow. going through egg collection and everything. So I, I mean, I suppose I would say to anyone is is to push back, and that is what clinics are meant to do. If it doesn't look like there's going to be many eggs collected or any at all, that's that's a high risk. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know whether you've got anything to to comment on that, Linda. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I was like, yeah, um, uh, because um, definitely, I mean. In, in some women, we're not expecting to get a lot of follicles or a lot of eggs. But if the expectation is that we should be getting more or possibly more, then um, we definitely should be having conversations about should we stop the cycle? Don't go through with, you know, the procedure, all of that. because the, the expectation is high, then you've got, you've had sedation, you've had a procedure, you've paid, well, if it's on the NHS, you haven't paid, but still, uh, or you might have paid for it and then, and it comes to nothing. So it definitely should be a conversation. And, and, and if you're going through that right now and you think, well, I've only got one or two follicles, could we do better? It's certainly, you know, it's, I, I'm having conversations like that every week. And sometimes we say, look, we don't think we're going to do better. So I think we should carry on. But in some cases it is. It's like, no, we need, let's stop. Let's restart. Let's rethink and let's go again. Yeah. I did, sorry, I don't know about you, Anita, but I did find that the having to have all the medication, the injections and stimulation, it did really aggravate my endometriosis. Mm. And it, I, I, felt, I felt a difference in symptoms and pains following on from, from the treatment. Yeah. Really? yeah so when I I think I mentioned to you both earlier my um, gynecologist ended up with being my IVF doctor um, and he and he was saying you know it, the medication is likely to aggravate your endometriosis um, which it did so that's why it was almost like 
I had a laparoscopy cleared out of the endometriosis, had IVF, and then six months later, it would come again. Um, and so then, then since learning and going to a different gynecologist that I should a never have had those many operations because of the impact it has on your body, but also how it impacted my fertility because my ovaries have been um, sort of operated on and it sheds layers of the ovary when you're clearing out the endometriosis. So my my AMH was naturally, well, dropping unnaturally because of it. So, yeah, there's lots to consider when you're looking at it from, you know, your health perspective, but also your fertility perspective and making sure that you're considering your long term health impacts, because I think we can so easily get absorbed in that. I want a baby. I, this is the outcome, which, yeah, absolutely you do. But I think it's thinking about what's going to what's going to be the impact to you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. And I suppose, Carla, with with your sort of sort of um, hat on and what the kind of work that you're doing in this field is it anything that is is changing anything new or significant that's coming through um, your um work? so at the moment um there's a few things happening so we i've been working with um a group for the british fertility society and we've developed a new guideline. So we're really focused around fertility preservation and people with endometriosis. And this kind of comes off the back in support of a campaign that we're working on at the moment, which, um, and I know Linda, you came along to it. We took to parliament um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, which is for people with severe endometriosis um, and those whose fertility is at risk or those who may be experiencing early onset menopause because of endometriosis to be considered for fertility preservation treatment. And the reason this campaign is, it's our first campaign as a charity, but the reason this is so important to me is because when I went through my diagnosis, as I mentioned, I was already under the gynecologist when I was 14. I was being refused smear tests because of my age at 19, generally thinking I had cancer because I had all these symptoms that I had no idea what was causing them. And I was just fobbed off and told to get on with it and you know just felt like nobody really cared or, or or cared to look into what was causing all these issues and by the time I was diagnosed it was too late and it was a case of if you ever want a chance of having biological children you need to freeze your eggs now but by this point I'd had four operations within one year lost my job lost my home relationship broke down moved back home with parents my life was just upside down it was yeah. just a horrible horrible time and I thought there is no way in hell I can pull seven, eight thousand pounds out of my pocket to freeze my eggs right now when it might not even work. Um, and I I remember I was speaking to my specialist um, consultant and he said, well, let's let's apply. Let's see if you get it. So I applied to my local CCG at the time. They're now ICBs um, for one round of egg freezing just to see if I might be eligible. So you apply by writing basically pleading for for this treatment and why you should have it which I think is a really horrible way to do it anyway um, and I was refused three times and the trick to it well not not a trick but they say automatically almost everyone's refused so if you do apply to your local ICB um, for uh, exceptional funding they call it it you should you likely you'll be refused but then you should always um appeal it so i appealed it three times and i was still refused and it was actually thanks to my local mp who supported me and appealed on my behalf i i was granted the one round of treatment but if it wasn't for him stepping in and getting involved in in that case i would never have had a i would never have now this chance of becoming of having biological children and it was actually that MP who helped me and set up the charity with me. And we took it to Parliament and we set up the all-party parliamentary group. Um, and he sadly passed away um, a couple of years ago now. But it was thanks to him that I got that treatment. And it was kind of in honour of him for us to do this campaign. And I'm just hoping that we can just open as many doors as possible and get as much support as we can. So that other people who are in a similar situation to me, who's you know 24 25 years old being told they can never have children unless they freeze their eggs but they're never going to be able to carry them you know just to have that and have that reassurance that actually there is a bit of support there i i you know it, yeah it just it, it baffles me that a condition proven to significantly affect fertility 
it, it's not supported so hopefully hoping over time we can change that yeah yeah definitely it's such an amazing amazing effort um and you know high hopes that it, it's gonna you're gonna take it somewhere Fingers crossed. I know, Linda, we have a webinar tomorrow with the chair yeah. of the party parliamentary group. So I'll be nudging her a few questions to yeah. get the next <laughs> steps out of her following our, our campaign day. Mm. <laughs> uh, and, and it, I, I suppose, Carla, when I was listening to you, what I was taking away is, is don't take the first no as an answer. No. Keep and pushing. get as many people involved as you possibly can. I help on a personal level a lot of people with their appeals for egg freeze and IVF um, because what you tend to find is oh you're a single woman no you know but okay that's fine I'm a single woman but I'm also about to have surgery to remove my ovaries and fallopian tubes and possibly my uterus you know so there's a lot of barriers um, so it is a case of just really getting it onto the table, print it out in front of them all so that they can all read it at their group meetings, whatever they do, um, at, and having your your story there and, you know, just explaining and being honest. Um, I had to, like, write, you know, real in-depth letters of appeals, um, but to be knocked back, it was, it was horrible. It was the most awful time. And I always knew I wanted to be a mum, you know, even from just being a young girl. So mm. it really affected me you know, emotionally. Um, but to get that treatment, it just meant the world to me. And as, as I said, I didn't get very many, but you only need one, right? Who knows? Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, just keep in, keep appealing. And if you can get your GP to write a supporting letter, um, you can get your specialists to write a supporting letter. You can encourage them to do a referral and just keep going. Yeah, no, absolutely. If, if you um, are in a situation where that is the next step, otherwise, the chances are zero then you've just got to keep pushing yeah great advice definitely I, I second that and a lot of the time you know GPs are you know we all know that they're, they're lacking in time they're lacking in resource and and so sometimes you do have to I think really reiterate and make it very clear what you're experiencing and I suppose I suppose on my journey the thing that I was told is you know periods are painful but actually they're not meant to be painful to the to the degree that you know it's debilitating you can't function um and do things like go to work and you know things like that yeah. so i think it's important that you do really push and like you were saying earlier carla is take take your do your research and and kind of have it laid out there because they can't ignore the facts mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I, and I suppose from, from your experience, what you've seen um, in the work that you do, Carla and, and yourself, Linda, is there anything else, you know, that would be useful for people to know in terms of the, the link between endometriosis and infertility and, and, and what might help? I think the link is very strong. And as Linda kind of explained, there's so many different ways that endometriosis can affect fertility. Um, and I think there's certainly more research that needs to be had in in order to look into it more and as we know with endometriosis research is lacking um mm -hmm. but i think the more there is you know talks like this you know just making people aware and it might and i understand not everybody might want to have children but for me i i just think it's so important that we have a choice and i think you know and it, even for people and we do a lot of events particularly around fertility with this campaign that we're running at the moment where We'll, we'll see young, particularly younger people and they'll say oh I never want children like but sometimes you might feel like that now but actually that you might change your mind later on so it's just important that we're aware and just just yeah just in tune with everything that's going on and if we are worried then to, to get it checked out yeah I think that's yeah it's, it's, it's exactly that isn't it some you know when you're 20 or you know you might not be thinking about the future in that way um but it's i think i personally i think the things that i see that um i that i get worried about in my sort of practice is um is if you've got an endometriotic cyst and someone wants to remove it just make sure that that is a discussion that's been had with a gynecologist who either has an interest in fertility or has spoken to a fertility specialist before anyone touches your ovaries and um, that would be my number one because I do see that and 
and and also do your research and make sure you're getting operated on by you know by a, a good surgeon as well that's going to preserve your ovary as much as possible your ovarian tissue so that would be that and then um yeah and just and just generally um if you can um because actually gynecologists should be um if they if fertility is not their thing they should be actually managing and uh, women with significant endometriosis in a multidisciplinary kind of way which is involving you know bowel surgeons bladder surgeons if they need to and fertility specialists as well so um so don't feel sh you know hesitant in sort of making saying have have you discussed my case with you know um with with a fertility doctor for example um and and it, it's natural some some doctors may may get offended but you know your it's your body it's your fertility it's your future so sometimes you just have to have have those conversations I think yeah no definitely and and you know don't be afraid to self-advocate that's I think really important um and making sure that you're comfortable and content with what's being presented and what your your, your treatment plan looks like that's going to be really important um but I think for me that and I, I kind of touched on it earlier is, is the how it affects you mentally so I know endometriosis um and infertility is very much you, you tend to focus on the physical side um but I think understanding how it impacts mentally so for myself it did create a, a health anxiety where I was very much on alert you know any symptoms I've had um, I've had a, a laparoscopy it's been cleared up and then any kind of sign I would panic uh, and be straight to the doctor um, and you know I think in those moments if you are under a gynecologist and you're able to sometimes even to have a scan um, just to see whether there is anything going on in terms of your ovaries that could be useful when you're thinking about things like fertility um, but I think don't ignore the impact on you mentally uh, because you know I went through a very long journey where it did impact me mentally leading to things like depression anxiety and you know getting a diagnosis of endometriosis is, is is a big thing as a chronic condition of huge impacts and implications on your life so I think it's understanding that it could lead to trauma um, PTSD so I think it's being kind to yourself and understanding that actually this is this is, this is a big deal and getting support if if and when you need it especially if you're then going on to go into sort of IVF or anything any sort of fertility treatment so I suppose those are some of my learnings um, in terms of how to support yourself going through that process but I think ultimately is not to judge yourself we can do that quite easily when you've been diagnosed with a condition which means that you potentially are not able to conceive and I think it's recognizing that you know you would never choose to have that condition um and it's not your fault and you, you can only do what you can do to to support yourself in getting pregnant but as I was saying earlier make sure you take care of yourself and think of the the longer term impacts on your on your health um, and before we move into Q and A, so um, in the you might want to be thinking about some questions. Um, in the meantime, you can send them direct to me, but I'll, we're also giving an opportunity to come off mute. But I suppose any sort of learnings for yourselves, um, Linda or Carla, that you you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think I was fairly similar to you. I had this kind of anxiety and panic, but I was the opposite. I was like running away from doctors not and, and not <laughs> wanting to communicate because I just, any, even just having a letter through the door with, and seeing the hospital stamp on it would just send me into panic mode. And I think Anita, oh. similar to you, when you have that diagnosis and it's so late and things have gone so far, you just kind of roll into this spiral of bad news after bad news after bad news and you have an operation to come out and you need another and you've only just got over the anxiety and the recovery from that and it was just ongoing bad after bad after bad and the kind of there's a lot of unknowns so it was a really difficult time for me but I also feel like it all happened so fast that I didn't have a moment to just process what was going on it was it was all a big emergency and then all of a sudden I'm at a specialist hospital and you know, it, it was just a lot happening at one time and there's fertility, there's bowels, there's bladder, there's, you know, it, it was a lot. And I, yeah, I think I just snapped and I was just like done with this. 
had such bad anxiety. I put off the surgery that I really desperately needed for like three years because I couldn't face going to back to the hospital because it was just too much. It was too much. Um, but one thing I would say is just learning my setting my boundaries really and I'm I'm I've always been not a people pleaser but I hate saying no and I you know I don't like letting people down and I would do things out of you know just making sure because I said it I'd, I'd have to do it but actually there were times where I didn't want to even step outside my house I just wanted to curl up and watch a film and and or put on a face mask or just veg out in bed whatever and just switch off from the world and I would, and I'd feel so good for it because I'd find myself, you know, I'm 32 now, my friends all having babies, get married, da, da, da. there's a lot of triggering things that are going around me mm. and if I'm not in a great place to go into that environment. It's just going to make me feel like crap even more. So just setting those boundaries and thinking, do you know what? I really don't feel like doing that today. I'm not going to do it. I don't have to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I think that's something that, has actually really helped me and I still do it now if I if I've taken on a bit too much unless I have to have to do it I say do you know what that's that's not going to make me feel any better that's not going to make me feel good about what I'm doing I'm just going to take some time out and that's okay I think it's really important that we allow ourselves that time to just step back and look after ourselves Absolutely. I think that's yeah amazing advice because I think that's just amazing advice for life in general and mm. you know I think a lot of women are probably in the same boat as you know I can't say no and actually this year for me has been a, a, a big turning point actually obviously I don't have endometriosis but just in light with life in general it's like what makes me happy and what makes me feel good and I don't mm -hmm. have to do the things that don't make me feel good yeah. and actually that's like a, such a silly thing but that it's yeah you, you get so um you know I have to be social I have to exercise I have to eat well I have to you know I have to be everything for everything um but actually you're completely right it, you just sometimes have to take that step back and um I think that's great advice yeah and I think as well even as well with kind of social media I'm not a big social media person but I do run the charity accounts and then I've got my own which I kind of use for educational purposes but just like when there's, you know, infertility awareness, we've got endometriosis awareness month. Like it's, it can be a lot, you know, and it's okay to just take some time away from that, you know. Um, yeah, just again, putting those boundaries in and, and, and putting yourself first. Yeah, and I think just to add to that is when, especially when you're on a fertility journey, if you don't want to go to that baby shower, don't go. If you don't want to be around family who, are, who ask you awkward questions, then remove yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Put in your boundaries. And just take care of yourself because it's not not an easy journey to be on. Yeah, yeah. Linda, you used to say we done an event re um, not recently. It was kind of in the summer last year, um, and you was talking about talking kinder to your to your body, and that always stuck with me. And I love the way you said it. And I'm totally I'm in the menopause now, so I forget everything. But I just <laughs> love what you said uh, about that kind of kindness to yourself yeah I think it's so important that you think it's just sort of I I will say it to my my patients who come and do egg freezing I'm like look you'll probably feel quite rotten in those two weeks so just look after yourself don't plan big nights out you know say no to that thing just look up like just be kind to yourself because <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you, we all it's nice to curl up on the sofa and do nothing but but then you feel the guilt about it and then it takes away the niceness of it and it's just being kind and saying it's fine this is okay exactly and when you said that color what it reminded me of I when I got diagnosed and then I was going on this fertility journey I had this real disconnect with my body that I was angry with my body because it's not doing what I wanted it to do what it should be doing what everyone else is doing and I think it took me a while again to recognize that and realize that actually I need to be kinder to my body because it's going through a lot and it's getting me through yeah Absolutely, absolutely. I don't want to moan, but <laughs> I went, went before I had my last kind of big operation. Obviously, at that time, I'd gone through the egg freezing journey. It wasn't a success, but we still want a few. Um, but I just remember I looked pregnant, but my stomach was so swollen and heavy, and I had this sickness. It was like I had all these pregnancy symptoms, but I, at the time, I knew I wouldn't ever be pregnant. So psychologically, that can be really quite damaging and confusing. Um, oh, but, yeah, yeah, but it comes back to that space of just letting yourself 
you know, giving yourself that time, that space, but also not shutting yourself away um, to, 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 you know, process what's going on. Sorry, I, I got distracted by a chat. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and to be, um, just before we go to questions, I just wanted to add, um, I lost track the amount of times people have offered me their seat on the train, on the tube, on the bus, because they thought I was pregnant, because I had endo belly. Um, <laughs> it was swollen but I just I just learned to kind of just let it go and be like no I'm fine it's it's yeah <laughs> not let it bother me it's gone, um, yeah. but yeah so uh, we have had some questions come through um I'll start with the first one um can you still conceive regardless of what stage of endometriosis you are at yep yeah yeah okay um so someone has shared that they recently had a laparoscopy to remove an ovarian cyst and was diagnosed with endometriosis and 80% of the ovary has been saved um, and sadly experienced two miscarriages in the last year. How soon after a laparoscopy can I start trying again and how long will it take my ovary to recover? I know a lot of specialists kind of advise pretty pretty quickly, don't they? But then again, it depends on your history and so I think it, I don't know it's difficult to say your specialist should tell you that though right that, that, yeah that's exactly what I was going to say it's kind of you know generally speaking a laparoscopy you know a proper full recovery is like it is it's still full thickness abdominal incision so it's sort of six weeks um you know recovery even though you're probably feeling fine after a couple of weeks um but your surgeon should tell you because we don't know exactly what work they've done and so in your case, it might have been relatively straightforward, but or there might have been some more um, reasons why, you know, blood loss, for example, or um, any potential in, you know, injuries that they could have come across uh, at the time of the surgery as well. But yeah, generally speaking, you know, like recovery is about six weeks. And I'm sorry to hear about your mis miscarriages as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Anita, are people able to, is there a feature where they can raise a hand if they're, if yeah. they're a Christian? I've yeah. forgotten how to do it. Yeah, so, okay, so you, oh, we've had a few questions oh, in the chat, um, but oh, we've had someone raise their hand. So, um, Georgia, um, if you'd like to come on and ask a question. Yeah, yes, please. Um, first off, thank you all of you for creating a really, I think, positive conversation about quite a difficult topic. Um, so it's felt like a really safe space and really, you know, nice environment. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. So I'm I'm 24 and very nearly 25. I got diagnosed with stage four uh, and it's on my bowel and things like that. Um, but in my most recent trip to A&E, um, they said to me that to not to have a laparoscopy before I would, you know, like to try for having a baby which would be in the next two years or so. Is that the best advice? It wasn't a specialist who I spoke to and I'm just not sure about the nature of, I'm in a lot of pain and I feel like another laparoscopy is pending and needed. Um, mm -hmm. But then I don't want to put my fertility journey back and I just feel in a bit of a, I'm being pulled both ways. Um, so I'd really appreciate some advice, please. I mean, so, so just at, at a very basic level, you know, if, you, if you've been seen in A&E by a gynecologist, generally speaking, that's going to be a very junior member of, of the team. Not necessarily. Um, sometimes a senior registrar will come, but we often mm -hmm. won't be a consultant. It might be a senior house officer. And so I've heard, and, you know, they they will be giving you the advice to the best of their knowledge. But, um, but I think the, the right thing to do is to um, go back and see... Uh, I'm assuming, given that you were given a diagnosis of stage four with it being on the bowel, and you've you've seen mm. you you have a gynecologist, a consultant gynecologist that you've seen before. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky with my um sort of situation. I don't want to dwell on it too much because there's many other people, but um I'm sort of between healthcare in in Cardiff and also now that I moved back to the Midlands. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so the, the specialists are down in Cardiff, but I'm now back in the Midlands, so. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated with knowing who the, the less specialists are in my now local area. Yeah, I wonder if your gynecologist could recommend someone to you uh, mm -hmm. and if not go through your GP. I know it's hard. I know it must be so hard and, and for putting your trust in a new team um, as well. But I definitely would um, see, see a specialist um, to make those decisions. OK, thank you very much. 
Thank you. And um, we've had a few more questions come in. Um, so someone who has stage two endometriosis um, and is asking what are the advisable steps to take to test fertility, um, currently 24 years old? Shall I take it, Carla? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so, um, very, so various places, and, and we do it here as well, we do like a fit for fertility assessment um, sort of consultation, which is um, you have a scan so we can have a look at your ovaries and just your general gynae health. It's not just fertility focus, but it's sort of looking at your gynae health in general. Um, but also looking at your egg reserve and um, by looking at your ovaries and also we do an AMH level. Um, now the AMH, you know, it is a measure of your egg reserve, but it's really important to understand, you know, what it can and can't test for. Um, and um, and equally, you know, sometimes it can uh, lead to anxiety um, by knowing the number and worrying about the number. So I would say it's really um, something to consider doing if um, uh, when you've really considered that, uh the, the sort of the outcomes that you might that you might be given but essentially it's, uh, the the actual follicle count is one way of measuring your egg reserve your egg numbers your total egg numbers and uh and your amh is another way it's a blood test it's a hormone um but that's not really telling us the whole picture it doesn't tell me about your ability to conceive naturally it doesn't tell me about your egg quality but it does give you some information so for example if it is low at the age of 24 we it might give us that um, increased like impetus to say, actually, maybe you should consider freezing your egg. Um, and so just things like that. But that those would be the things that I would recommend doing. And just a second part to the question was that they've been on the mini pill for 10 years. Um, uh -huh. it, would they need to kind of detox before any testing to get a, a sort of accurate picture? To get the most accurate picture, yes, but I do know that some women who are on hormonal contraception to manage their endometriosis symptoms, you know, are going to be quite rightfully reluctant to come off any treatment in case their symptoms come back. So um, sometimes some women will just do the testing to see because it might not have an impact. It might not have a, a sort of suppressive impact on your egg numbers. And so we might have a look and be sort of think, oh, yeah, that's really good. Um, but if I see a patient who is on hormonal contraception, who does the test and things are quite low, lower than I would expect, then we might have a period of coming off it. It gives us sort of a more of a reason to come off that, which um, some women are just reluctant to do if, if they've got really bad symptoms. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, are there bio biomarkers available to confirm diagnosis to avoid invasive um, surgery? I mean, no, um, in, in terms of biomarkers for endometriosis. Mm. Um, I mean, Carla and, and both of you actually will know sort of a big a big reason to do surgery is for symptoms, um, you know, and, that, and that's sort of what I think the conversation that you would have with your consultant. And I, I'd be interested to hear what your experiences are, but it's not it's not often you know it's not that we do a scan and we say someone's got stage four they need surgery because some women with stage one will have crippling symptoms and they will need surgery so i think it's more how your quality of life and your symptoms what do you guys think and there are i mean there's 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 some noise here every, every now and again around kind of non-invasive tests isn't there but at the moment i don't think I mean, there's some that are fairly close, but I don't think there's anything reliably um, accurate just yet, which hopefully will be soon, because wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I'd like to invite Kira. Um, she's asked to come on to ask a question. Are you still there? Kira? Okay. Maybe Kira will come back. Um, okay, we've had a question um, about whether either of you had any experiences with injections like Prostap to induce uh, menopause. Um, she's having the first injection tomorrow um, and is feeling nervous and is just wondering about things like side effects, but also the probability of success as they enter the first cycle of IVF. So I had Prostap. Um... And one thing that I think is really important 
to tell you because no one told me and I've heard it from so many other people is that when you start pro the prostate injections you actually have a real surge of um symptoms in the first few days maybe up to a week um and I didn't know this and so I had my injection and then I felt really really poorly I had a big swollen tummy I felt sick I, it was just, it just wasn't very nice but it is actually really common to have this surge uh, just shortly after your first injection just so just to be aware of that especially if you have plans or you're going out to dinner or you know you have anything kind of in the diary because I did feel rubbish and a lot of other people did as well who I've spoken to but they don't tend to tell you that so <laughs> note for the diary um and also if you can I mean I had quite a, a rough time with it because naturally my my ovaries were failing so my hormones were really really low and then when I was given this injection to to dampen my hormones even more they just floored and I really struggled but if you can um to ask for add back HRT they usually give it in a form of tiblone and this can really help with the symptoms like hot flushes or trouble sleeping and if you don't get on with that you can also you can ask for a, a combined uh, estrogen progesterone patch which can which can also help um, we have got a lot of information about, about the GNRH analogues on our website, the endometriosisfoundation.org, but it is important to know that you shouldn't take these injections for any longer. Is it six months? Six um, months, due, yeah. due to, at, one, at one time, due to the risk of bone thinning. So if you do take them, um, do, do be aware that you shouldn't take them for any longer than six months at one time. And if you do take them for any longer, then to be sure to have... Um, regular bone density scans which are called DEXA scans and it just checks the bone density um, that there isn't sign of bone thinning. I think I captured it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we've had a question come through from someone who actually works in a hospital and covers maternity wards um, and has uh, spoken to occupational health about endometriosis and it's finding it quite triggering working on these wards manager isn't quite approachable any advice on how to have that conversation or deal with the environment and um, they find themselves working in I think for me I quite often I find um it easier to write things down so if there may be an email address that she can reach her manager via it might be better for her to just write it down and then at least it's there it's, you've got a trail of it you know if they don't answer then you're going to know about it because you can just ping them you know give them a nudge so maybe if, if you're having trouble come in to have that conversation face to face write it down in an email or perhaps talk to one of your colleagues and bring them along with you and, and, and to have that conversation so that they can help kind of fill in any gaps where you might feel uncomfortable yeah and I think it's um knowing for yourself okay what you'd like so almost going into that conversation with some solutions to some of your challenges that can help do the thinking ahead and also set out what is it that you want from the conversation? What do you want from them that can help them? Um, but yeah, really, I think making it clear in terms of what you what you are needing and, and what that could look like, I think. Could we've them. actually, um, through the charity, we've, I mean, I've made some lifelong friends just through people that I've met through the charity who have used, you know, our online support groups and actually come across a few nurses who were working on, on these um, wards and we're really struggling and sometimes you know they have to make a decision and I, I did it myself I wasn't working in that sector but I was working in a field where I was really struggling physically emotionally and I and I changed my direction because it just wasn't working for me so I think also um, when you do get to that stage where you something's making you feel worse you know having that kind of courage and just again being being kind to yourself you know is this working for me is it not what other direction can I take you know um mm. just being mindful of that too that you're not stuck and there is um there are other options that could be explored and you could find yourself in a totally different department and really enjoying it yeah absolutely just conscious of time have you got a couple of more minutes um got a couple more questions is that okay Linda mm. yeah okay um and it's another question around AMH test. How much does this actually tell about your fertility and what is considered too low? Yeah, I mean, it gives us um, certainly the fertility, you know, working in the fertility field. Um, the AMH is really important when we are looking at um, sort of 
women who want to freeze their eggs or do IVF, um, create embryos, freeze embryos. So it is a really important measure. It, what it's telling me, generally speaking, is um, as a measure of the egg reserve, so your egg numbers that you have in your ovaries, um, which you're born with. Um, and it's what it's really telling me is how responsive your ovaries are going to be to stimulation. So it helps to decide what dose of drugs you should be on. And so it's, it is a really important measure. But like I said before, it doesn't give us, there's a lot of things it doesn't tell us. And so it's not the whole picture. It doesn't tell us everything about your fertility, um, but it's really important if you're doing any type of fertility treatment. And I didn't quite, ca I can't remember the last, second part of that question. Was there a second part? Um, what is considered too low in terms of uh, AMH levels? AMH is a range um, and there is no sort of abnormal in that way. Um, but there are certainly times when I will say, yes, yeah, I would ex I might have otherwise expected your AMH to be a bit higher than that. So it's difficult to say what's what's low because it's low. It will be different for different people. Yeah, thank you. And we have Kira back. Um, Kira, are you able to come on now? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry, I'm not very good on Zoom, and yeah, I <laughs> it froze. <laughs> um, <laughs> So basically, I've got um, stage four um, endo, um, and like you guys say, obviously speaking about it and making it more aware, I went to the doctors probably quite a few times, and they just kind of felt my stomach and was like, no, there's nothing wrong, um, which, again, unfortunately, it was like a year wait for the NHS, and I obviously didn't want to wait that long um, because my wedding has had been postponed due to COVID, and obviously... That was back in 2020 and obviously by then we wanted to have kids and then I ended up having to go private which again it, it you know it costs a lot of money and I'm very fortunate that I can you know I'm able to afford that which there's people out there that wouldn't be able to um so I had stage four endo um and I not long just had a round of IVF which was a failed round of my first IVF um and I just wanted to, I think I'm just worried about going in again for the second time because I've heard mixed things about, you know, like when you go through it, it can sort of disturb your endo or it can make it worse. Um, so I'm just a little bit worried about what's the right next step to do. Yeah, um, Kira, that's it. It's, I'm sorry to hear that it was an unsuccessful round. That must have been super hard really really hard um for you um it's really difficult for me to be able to give you any sort of like that's quite specific advice about what to do next at not being your doctor not knowing your full history um so I, I i can't really give you specific advice for you but i would say um you know if you've had an unsuccessful round then you definitely have um you know you should be having those conversations with your with your fertility specialist, particularly, you know, um, it's part of, for example, the package that we have at, at my fertility clinic is that the, the, the follow-up is, you know, really- Yeah, so I did of... originally go through the NHS, which I don't feel was sort of, I don't feel like my aftercare was that great. So my next mm -hmm. kind of option would be to go private, which they seem amazing. And I seem to be getting looked after a lot more better with even just, you know, getting in contact and everything. But mm -hmm. it's just, I think once you go through a first round, it's just trying to kind of keep like positive. Um, but I have found like acupuncture and reflexology and things like that have helped. I don't know if anyone else has um, found acupuncture and reflexology. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I had acupuncture myself actually when I was um, having IVF, and I, I, I really, I really loved it. And the only thing I would say is that usually, there, if you've had one round of IVF that's been unsuccessful, there, there is usually things that we can do to try and optimize the second cycle. So it's definitely well worth uh, exploring your options um, because okay. we learn so much from a, a one cycle of IVF, and so there's definitely things. In, for the most part that we can do to try and get get a better outcome the second time and I, I hope this new clinic um you know gives you what you're hoping for okay thank you good luck Kira thank um, you 
And one last question. Um, somebody is asking about reproductive immunology and endometriosis. So they've sadly had a three miscarriages um, and suspected endometriosis, very high natural killer cells, um, and have been recommended to go for laparoscopy um, before trying to have a baby again. They're asking how long does it typically take before the um, endo heightened Im immune system comes back? again after a laparoscopy with excision just don't know do you it's hard to tell and everybody's so different for me i remember having an operation and literally within a few months i was back in agony and whereas some people can have an operation and then be they might not need anything else then that's it um, it's, it's really hard to tell but again those the conversations to have with your with your specialist team i'll pass it on to linda <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would say about natural killer cells is, you know, that might not be related to the endo. Um, so um, that if, if I was looking after you, then I would be looking at the natural killer cells sort of separately and look and managing that separately to your management of your endometriosis, because they may not be linked. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so that that's the only other piece of advice I would give. Okay. Um, thank you both so much. Um, that's been a great conversation and thank you everyone who's um, asked questions and, and hopefully that's been help to, helpful to others. So thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Carla and Linda for your time. Um, thank you. And thank yeah, you. we'll get thank some you. recording. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.